this is gonna take a moment. I'm sorry, just trying to get the uh, the Facebook live feed going here. Um, but Carol, please go ahead with your introduction. Okay, thank you so much. Well, welcome, and I'm so glad you could attend our first virtual session of HARP's programs. Uh, I, I wanted to thank the speakers for being willing to do this, and uh, thank Sherry Hayes Zorn for making all the contacts so this could happen. So as John was saying, this is going to be a, a talk about the Transcontinental Railroad, 150th anniversary. Remember Reno with its 1868 start uh, was there because of the railroad. So transportation is what made Reno to begin with. Uh, our next presentation is going to be Wednesday, May 20th. Uh, correct that one. And it's about Joe Neal. It's also officially our annual meeting. So we'll do our annual meeting for about five minutes uh, prior to the speaker's presentation. And we'll just have a few announcements for you then. So thank you for being here. Um, I appreciate what everything, everyone is going through with the staying at home uh, and social distancing. And uh, let's all do that together. Now I'm gonna turn it over to our speaker, Dan Thielen. And Dan is the director of the State Railroad Museums, uh, not just the one in Carson City, but also the one in East Ely and the one in Boulder City. So he's our railroad man. Dan, over to you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna show a video that um, Lieutenant Governor Hutchison was kind enough to make for us on his way out, but they did such a fine job at summing what the museum is that I think it's worth looking at. Um, and John, if you could play that right now. Trains change everything. And we have the representation of that pivot point. Dan, tell us where we are now. You're at the Nevada State Railroad Museum and the Jacobson Interpretive Center in Carson City. And when visitors come here, what can they expect to see? And, and what's, uh, what's the purpose of being here making this part of the trip? The Nevada State Railroad Museum has the finest collection of 19th century railroading equipment on the planet. We have the oldest continuously operating locomotive in the world. And that's the locomotive in Peter, where Peter, we're uh, at a very interesting place uh, in Nevada. Tell us where we're sitting currently uh, and where we are in general. Well, we're uh, in the historic McKean Motor Car, which was a uh, product of the McKean Car Company in Omaha, Nebraska, built in 1910. That's absolutely beautiful. What is it about this museum here that you see here in Carson City? We've learned over time that, that museum experiences that include hand-on activity and that are story-based are just so much more effective in creating new memories, and that's what we're all about. We have the largest operable collection of 19th century local movies and equipment that people can come up, get close to and experience with the passion of staff and volunteers to tell them what that's all about, why it's important. What can people do when they come to the museum in terms of interacting and experiencing railroad, railroad history during the time of check? You transport yourself to that moment. You feel it, you smell it, and you touch it. It's an opportunity for everybody. You can come here and you can get deep into the history. Thank you. So we'll move. We'll move to our first slide. I, 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 I'm the director of the Railroad Museum in Carson City. I will admit to you that um, I peeked into a few people that were attending, and I'm always intimidated by Stephen Drew and 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 Mike McLean. And I'm glad you're here. Uh, but um, you guys should be the ones talking about this stuff, not me. But I also peeked, and I saw my cousin from. Uh, Wisconsin was here, so Western Wisconsin representing my cousin Nancy Geister, and she always 
makes people calm. So it's, it's cool. So uh, if we could have our first slide, is that up yet? The Railroad Museum has a tremendous amount of committed and dedicated staff and um, they, for 40 years, this is our 40th anniversary this year, have kept and nurtured and restored that collection to what it is today. And I, I just feel fortunate that I get to be part of them. And um, it's, it's, a great, it's a great museum and it's great staff and we have phenomenal volunteers. Should you feel like you would like to join our friends organization, we would invite you to. The friends are critical to our existence and, and they support every aspect of what we do. And, and um, our friends help us up. We couldn't operate the trains and we couldn't open it up the museum without their help. So if you wanna be part of this tremendous program, Give us a call, and and we'll we'll get you put, put in the right direction. So in this in this presentation, I want to talk about a lot of things. We can go to the next slide. John has made this so easy, and I know that working with tech is so hard. But what what a wonderful wonderful amount of work he's put in to make this go easier on me, um, and I appreciate it. So. We, we, we had some difficulty getting the sound, but I want you to think about Vivaldi's Four Seasons and, and, and um, think about that beautiful spring song. America, and, and consider what America was in between, let's go uh, between the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 and, and 1844, where um, the most of North America was untouched by Western hands, and 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 it was a a tremendous area of wealth and resources to be tapped, and 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 also psyche of the psyche of of Western Europe, where people wanted to have hope for the future, but it was it was pastoral. It was not the, the, if you think about what was going on in Europe at the time with the industrial revolution well into its, you know, um, 50 to 100th year of, of, of operation and cities growing up in England and in Europe um, and, and manufacturing bases and coal mining like nobody had ever thought of and, and steam starting to really play a part in the industry. But America at that time was the untouched virgin frontier. You, if we can go to the next slide. Um, we, we had, America was almost the Garden of Eden, the endless possibilities. And um, with, uh, with those thoughts coming into mind, you get the, the, the um, manifest destiny where America is going to, the only thing stopping us from going from coast to coast was, was the, you know, the sovereign nation of Mexico. And President Polk sorted that out in 1847, where the entire continent was going to be the United States of America. In this time, Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1844, he decides he, he wants to um, get back into writing. And um, I think he took some time out as a tax surveyor on the East Coast in, in Wisconsin, or, or not Wisconsin, good grief, in uh, Massachusetts. And um, as a agrarian farmer, statesman, the psyche, he goes out in the middle of the woods and, and decides with a, want, wanting to, to get back a, to write. And he decides he's going to lay in this wooded glen and write about everything that he saw from the bees buzzing and birds singing and and people walking through the area and he just wrote train of thought and um at one point he says he could hear workers sharpening their sides and 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 i'm thinking and and he was remarking that it was at some distance away and sharpening their sides meant um Meant, I mean, that's a pretty quiet operation, but he heard it, the stone on steel echoing around. And, and, then, and then he writes this next, he writes this next statement. Give me the next slide, please, John.
and he says that he hears the locomotive, a long shriek, and for the space of a mile, it cannot mollify it into harmony. And I've heard a lot of locomotive whistles, and most of them sound like music, they, they're, especially at the, the, a mile away from them. Some of them, you know, we've got a couple of, of pitchy ones that, 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 but in general, they're just beautiful. And, and so with this thought, I was in graduate school, and, and I was working on a living history farm, and I had already been a steam engineer for close to 10 years. I, I was uh, a naval engineer for the Navy, and, um, and then when I got out of the Navy, I had run boilers of all different types, burning all different types of fuel, and they were loud. And, and you just put earplugs in and you got ready for it. And then I was at graduate school and I was studying things and, and reading Hawthorne and, 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 and trying to get my mind around how a early steam engine must be some sort of mysterious thing that I wasn't aware of because, yeah, stuff was loud, but it wasn't this, this harshness that destroyed Eden with it. it. It was a necessary tool to get things done. And we had a steam traction engine, a case steam traction engine at school. And, and they assumed I knew how to run it because I could run steam and I, you know, pretended as best we could, but we steamed it up. And when it came time to pull the throttle lever to make that thing run, um, the person I was working with me, my brother-in-law and I put earplugs in because, you know, this is going to be loud and pulled the throttle lever. And when that thing rolled over and started chugging, we looked at each other and almost laughed because it was the most gentle sound and it was rhythmic and, and, and soft and, 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 um, and, you know, blew the whistle and made it run. And it, it just was everything but loud. And we took our earplugs out and never put them back in, went and threshed wheat for a couple of weeks and then, and then put the thing away. And after that, I tried to get my mind around what Nathaniel Hawthorne was talking about. And that was the point is America was a peaceful and quiet place like I don't think many of us can imagine. We have so much uh, noise that is always around us from fluorescent lights to um, refrigerators and automobiles and airplanes and things like that, that we just sort of tone it out where something as gentle as as a, a steam locomotive, which is quite frankly, a, a pretty quiet thing when it's running. And, and um, we changed America. And, 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 and that was sort of the thought of, wow, you almost can't turn back the clock when you, when you think about how quiet it was, how peaceful it was when something as gentle as a steam locomotive would destroy it for him. Next slide. When, when, when Nevada became a state in 1864, it was the only state in the Union that didn't have a uh, navigable waterway. It, if you look at the United States, you can almost follow the settlements and growth of the states as, as, um, as you just pick the region, you look in Texas and you know cotton is coming through there and, and beef is coming through there. But, Commerce built this country, and that country was built on the ability to get both products to where you're working and the products out that you've developed. And so all of the states were built where you could either get them to market by animal power, meaning horses or oxen, or you put them in a barge or a river raft or something and, and moved it downstream or you sailed the things around. If you look at this country, the Louisiana Purchase is largely untouched by rivers and things like that. That great interior of the United States um, was hard to get to. And in a lot of ways, it was as tough to get to as it was getting to the moon. So uh, when you consider a couple of different things on this. The, the other part is manufacturing, having, having um, work being able to be done. Again, it had to either be by wind or it had to be done by um, power, wind power or, or by, um, by animals. Or you worked on the, 
or on the fall line. And if you go back to that slide just a little bit longer, you can see where the, um, you can see, yeah, thank you, John. You can see on the edges of the United States where you can capture the energy of the water as it makes its way to the sea. You can, you can use that power for manufacturing, you can use it for, for threshing, you can use it for a, a, a many other things, but that meant your manufacturing base had to be where the power is. The introduction of steam into the country both gives you command of transportation so you're not in, in a drought year where rivers don't flow, you still can get things moving. And, and it started to transform this country in ways we just can't imagine. And, and so we'll go to the next slide. And this is what um, Andrew Jackson said to, to Congress. And his idea was that steam power, we can, we, have the, we can explore the rest of the United States. And this was in 30 years before the transcontinental, or 30, 35 years before the transcontinental railroad was started. And, and he knew that in order to um, make the best use of the, the country, we would have to tie them together and he thought the best way would be steam power. And that's at the nascent, or at the beginning of the steam revolution. So we go to the next slide, and so much so that we knew that when Nevada was gonna be settled, or, or not settled, but um, created as a state, the seal of the state of Nevada, right in the back, you see it there, there's a, steam locomotive with a train on it on a on a trestle that has yet to be built and um it but it's only one of two states that have have a um locom or a train in it and the other is of course nebraska which was also without uh without a way to the sea so if we go to the next slide I want to talk just a little bit about what it meant for travel. And while I'm going to talk about the human condition in travel, um, I want you to think about what it means as moving freight and getting things to and from where you're working. So if you wanted to settle it out west, you, you were probably only moving about 13 miles a day across the U.S. So if you were coming to Nevada to settle and you started in Omaha, you had everything you owned with you, you had your animals. And so you'd get that all started, break camp and start walking. And by the time you uh, stopped for the day, it was about 13 miles. And then you took care of your animals, you set up camp, you made food, got ready for the next day. And then you did it again. And then you did it again. And, um, and every night when you went to bed, you were probably still in view of the campsite from the night before. And every time you woke up in the morning, you could see what you were walking through, particularly once you got to the Great Basin. There are mountain ranges after mountain ranges after mountain ranges. And um, as near as I can tell, you would see a mountain range for weeks. And every step you took, you knew that as that mountain got bigger and bigger and bigger, that range got bigger, you knew I'm going to go through it or over it or around it. But then when I got there, there's another one behind it. And it was range after range after range. And, I, and, and sometimes if you, if you drive across Interstate 80 sometimes, look down at your odometer and count up, uh, call it 15, call it 20 miles, but knowing that those mountains just get bigger and they just get bigger and they just get bigger. And after about five or six days of traveling, you might be at the base of them. It, it was arduous, it was hard, it was treacherous. Yeah, you, the, the challenges that you face as you're traveling across the country in this way, you, know, you could get lost, you could get, pick up an illness, you could be feeble, you could have starvation, you could suffer um, hostile indigenous peoples, you could have robbers that come and take your stuff, your wild animals could take care, of, take care, take you out. There's just one challenge after another and after another. And every bit of freight that got sent across the country could suffer those same things. It was a hard place to be and it was a hard place to cover and it was a hard place to, to, to survive when you're trying to do this. 
And when the trains came in, it took about an hour to cover what took four or five days of walking. And so since you go from the dawn of human time, your maximum speed you probably ever went in your life was the maximum speed the horse could run or you could run. The easiest ride you ever had might have been sailing someplace. But those speeds didn't change much until the railroads came in and 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 drastically changed what the time space issue of of people who wanted to get across the United States or freight that you wanted to get across the United States before the transcontinental came in if you ordered a part in Sacramento it depended on where it came from it either had to go around the tip of South America or it had to go around the uh, the isthmus of isthmus of Panama or it got carried by freight across the interior of the United States. It was a hard, hard way to get there and you would take months. The Transcontinental Railroad cut that to weeks and in some cases just a week of, of 24-hour driving. The, the other challenges you get is, uh, if for, for instance, if the, I, I use the Hastings cut off because the Donner Party got waylaid and there's stories out there that said the Donner Party, had they walked 15 more minutes a day for just a few weeks, they would have missed a snowstorm on Donner Summit and, and the, the cannibalism and horrors that followed them. Had they not taken what was supposed to be a, 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 the Hastings cutoff and, and saved themselves a week or two of time instead of adding a week or two of time, they, we wouldn't have heard, ever heard of them. And, and it was simple things like that, simple decisions that cost lives and, and, and brought horrors and tragedy that are now, are, are now firmly in our, our nightmares and of, of thought in, in the West. Um, so, but connecting the country by rail changed this. We're no longer set to come in, 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 be set by weather or by um, uh, time of year that you couldn't travel. Most people would hunker down. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. One, one thing I, I wanna talk, make a point of is that transition from, from muscle power or your own foot power or sailing there's still, I don't believe, you might have to go to the air, the, the time of air flying to get another significant transition in, in the change of, of our thought process on what it means to travel. If, if let's go to the next slide. Um, so if, uh, I, I want to, well, this, I want to talk just one more one more example. So the the Fitzsimmons Corbett fight that was taking place in in Carson City after the railroad was um, the Transcontinental Railroad was connected, uh, the San Francisco Examiner had a set of reporters and and an artist, and they watched the fight, and then they had set aside an express train from Carson City to to um, into um, Oakland and um, they before the fight was f was letting people out continually these guys bolted to the trains got on the trains wrote the stories and and started drawing the pictures that would go into the print edition in the the San Francisco Examiner they made the trip from Carson City to Oakland in about six hours and 11 minutes and today you can make that same car ride without, in, unless you're delayed by traffic or something like that. But in general, you could make that in four and a half hours. And that's only, you know, a 30% improvement over the time that the, the railroad allowed you to do it. And, and, and so it, it, that transition to speed and time by car, automobile still isn't as significant as the the transition from foot traffic and animal power to railroads, and and I and I love this this little this little picture of uh, Thomas Jefferson 
he was uh, the ambassador to, to um, France, and he had experienced some rice. They called it Piedmont rice because it was made in Piedmont, Italy. And he thought it would be really good if we could grow that rice in America. And of course, you weren't allowed to grab rice from just any willy-nilly country and steal it and take it back and compete with them. And so he thought he would just make his way down to Piedmont and grab some rice and then take it take it back to some friends in Virginia and 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 have them try to grow it there. And I love what he says about this. So you look at that trip, you know, it's it's quite a ways out of the way between Paris and Piedmont. And you go to the next slide and he says and and he said it was merely three weeks. Added merely three weeks to his travel. No big deal. And I and I pull this and so, yeah, you can go to the next slide. And, and I, and I um, pulled this quote out of Pride and Prejudice because Elizabeth Bennett and Fitzwilliam Darcy are arguing about what 50 miles really means. And he's saying, it's just half a day. You can do 50 miles in, 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 in 12 hours. What more do you want out of life? And Thomas Jefferson, the same way. It was only three weeks. I don't know how many excursions I could go on with my wife and my my children and say, you know what, we're going to go left up this road and wander around for three weeks. And how many of those people would actually put up with me after that? Let's go to the next slide. So as we talk about time and work, we, we, we look at that 50 miles that Darcy was talking about. And you look at between Carson City and Reno, and it's almost 50 miles, not quite, but you, if you had to do it on foot, you could do it in 11 hours. I know people who, who could hard march that, but they're, they're athletes. They're not the average guy who is working backbreaking labor and decides he wants to go to the mall up in Reno and, and, and buy some new clothes. You had to have a pretty well established reason to go there. Any any time my wife and I are going to go in on an eleven hour trip, we know weeks in advance, and and we know that when we get there, we're going to stay a while and come back. We certainly don't go eleven hours and turn around and come back. Well, rarely we do, and um, and so it it just put Reno on the other side of the world for all practical purposes. Let's go to the next slide. And that meant a lot to the life of the human being when you, most people prior to the Transcontinental Railroad and probably for well after that, lived and died within 30 miles of where they were born. Um, and when you left your family in the old world and you said goodbye to someone on the pier or you left them at the trailhead in your yeah, on the East Coast and, and knew that they were heading to the interior or you, you um, even dropped them off at the railroad, chances are that was the last time you would see them in this life, that, that you were saying goodbye to them. But consider the, hum the pressure that, that was on them because in Europe, it was not an easy life and probably generations of poverty had been going on in your own family for a thousand years, that once you were born on a piece of land, you could not get off of it because the rents were oppressive and you just carried on and carried on subsistence while working for other people and at the whim of other people. In America, brought the promise that, or the hope of the promise, that you could own the production of your own labor, that you could make something of yourself and that you could you could become your own person as a result of that. And the railroads fed right into that. Let's go to the next slide. Robert Peel was a British um, statesman and, and his idea is that when you have an improvement in, in communication and this, we're talking about either roads or, or in particular the railroad, the poor man can carry his labor, which may be his, is his most valuable commodity. The best thing that he has is his skills in his labor, and then he can take it to the guy who will pay him the most for that. And, and that changes 
lives because if you're not stuck where you're at and you have the freedom of movement to do what you want to do, then suddenly the world opens up to you. And if we go to the next slide, let's overlay this again. We'll go back to Carson City. And if you if you um, look at if if you're on foot, that little red circle is about where you could travel in an hour. And I use an hour because that's about the limit of the time that people will put up with um, will put up with um, the windshield time between work and home. If I got to drive an hour to get to work, that's about all the farther they would ever want to do that. And I've got to assume that if you're walking to work, about an hour is what you want because, you know, if there's an emergency, you want to have some hope of getting there where you can affect the outcome of it. So let's use that. And I'm, and again, I'm just supposing this. And then if you owned a horse, that, that, that widens out a little bit because a horse will travel considerably faster than a, a human can and and for a sustained longer period of time and so you, you look where you're able to go but if you think about that other map that i put up there reno now is in your your working area because that's well under 40 minutes and 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 the vnt the virginia Truckee, would make it between reno and carson city in an hour and so you're at the point where if you decided you wanted to stay working in car living in carson city but working in reno or the 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 opposite of that, you had the opportunity to do it because the trains ran on time and the trains ran all year round. The engineered bedding of the, the, the railroad allowed for operation during bad weather and fair weather and at winter and summer. And, and suddenly you had a reliable way to get to, to where you wanted to be. Prior to that, you shut down, and um, there's a lot of impassable places. If you had to do it by foot during a snowstorm or, or even in bad weather, you're just not going to choose to do that. And the train made that possible. There's heat in the coaches, and, and they maintain the tracks and plow the snow and make it, a, make it a, an important effort to, to transport back and forth. And the same went with, with the, the products that are brought to market and, and, um, and, and freight that you wanted to get out. It all could go year round all of a sudden. Next slide, please. So technology was a, a term coined by, um, by Jacob Bigelow and it represents the multiplication of effort. And, um, and so when you, whenever you put in a machine, whether it was making fabric or, or chopping wood or, or you added a machine into the mix, then one person suddenly could do the work of two or four or 10 or 15 people. And it, um, it, it, it made it so that one person could make even more money. The, the traction engine that, that I used on the, the Living History Museum was designed to, to run for, for hours and hours and hours. And some of these people did in, the, in, the, in the, the states like Nebraska and Iowa and Minnesota, when the railroads gave the land or sold the land, some of these farmers would grab these huge tracts of land and then, and then they would plow. And then at lunch, they would stop for lunch and turn the plow around and do the next furrow down the next, the, the next place. Because you, it, for mercy's sake, that steam, that steam tractor was a bear to turn and you need a lot of space to turn it. And there is no sense in, in following, you know, tight topography straight and long was the best way to go. And, and, um, but there is no way that two men could dig a furrow two miles long in a day and, and, or, or three or four miles long in a day, but they did when they had technology introduced and it started to enter every, every part of people's lives. Um, when the United States left Great Britain in the revolution, um, at that time, the United States was a, uh, a storehouse of materials and, and, and products 
unfinished that were sent to England and then cotton was turned into cloth and and timber were turned into ships and 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 the pot metals were turned into products and and the idea was England would be the factory and all the the um colonies and the holdings of the empire would would send raw product in they would turn them back out and then sell them back to the colonies and that was part of some of the um, friction between the United, the, the colonies and, and England. And it didn't, it didn't end after the war. The, the Great Britain punished the United States by not allowing them to have technology sent. And so um, a lot of the advances in steam and, 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 and other technologies, spinning mills and, and, and uh, fabric making and all the rest of that were closely guarded secrets. And you, with the advent of technology, you have the, um, you have the advent of industrial espionage, like, like uh, Thomas Jefferson did by trying to steal rice that, that from Piedmont, Italy to bring to the United States. Uh, England hoped that the vastness of the United States would keep, the United States from developing industry. And um, factories at that time were limited to where the fall line was, where the, where the water was making that last um, elevation change between the, the, where you were and, and the coast, where, where, you, where you could get work out of the water. And with the invention of steam engines, that all changed. And sometimes that, that the vastness of the United States worked against England because that very vastness meant we have to start developing our own technology. And a classic example of that was in the um, in Sacramento, where the um, Central Pacific was being built. And you think about buying these massive machines from Europe or from from other places and having them shipped and they either go across Panama or it goes around South America and it's brought in. And these massive machines, you break something and you send your order for a new part and it takes a month to get to the factory. And then whatever time it takes for them to manufacture it. And then a month and a half back to, to ship it to you or even three months if, if, if it, if it has to go by ship around the horn, then suddenly you've lost six, months of work and that machine is you're still making payments on it and so there becomes a a industry in sacramento that that builds up and and even in in carson city when the railroad shops had to build stuff for themselves it started a techno technology availability to other people who might need a machine built or repaired or or a you know something cast or something machine then railroad shops become become um, manufacturing bases of themselves um, for years after 1869 when the transcontinental was completed the sacramento shops were um, the largest or the the sp shop in in california was one of the largest employers in california for years afterwards and and the railroad it just became important for the railroads to stay operating and to stay operating, you needed to control the things that stopped you from operating. And that, so the Sacramento shops started building, building locomotives and started building um, coaches and, and equipment that, that as they learned the technology started building from the west to the east and and bring that technology in and as technology becomes more available prices go down it becomes more available to everybody else let's go to the next slide railroads had a tremendous impact on food as well um when when When, you, when the colonies were established and up through subsistence farming, most people were subsistence farmers or at least had some on the side. And typically, if you were outside of a major city, if you wanted to eat something, you had to grow it because um, uh, the, the availability of, of foods, there just wasn't a super 
supermarket or or um, other places for you to to buy vast amounts of other food. So if you we we have the um, acknowledgement of the the three sisters of corns, beef and corns, corn, beans and squash that complemented each other in growth and um, and and help people get through more famines than any other food. But it's a pretty um, it's a pretty narrow diet. You know, you could augment it with fruit and and of course beef or or any other wild animal that you caught. But the staples were what you had, and and those were those were the ones that kept your belly full. When the V and T completed their construction, they threw a party in in I think it was seventy two, and at this gala, this railroad gala, they um, celebrated. And the newspaper accounts go on and on about how there was fresh pineapple, there were oysters from California, there was there was um, seafood brought in that that made it because it was iced down. All those things are unheard of up to that point, unless you are very, very rich and you have a fast way to bring them over the top of the mountain. The, the, um, it, it, just, it just boggles the mind that prior to having reliable communication with the world, Things were things were rare, and it stood out enough. I can't imagine that you know anyone would ever throw a party today about or or make a remark that there is fresh pineapple because you can get fresh pineapple almost any time of the year now, and and um, if you want fresh fish, you can get fresh fish. It's just now part of our psyche. If we if we wanted those material those things, you get to have them. Um, the railroads also changed our agribusiness and 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 changed um it, it turned it so that people could could actually make a living um farming at that time instead of you know subsistence and selling a little bit extra than you made to to have a little cash on hand it became a it came, became a business railroads made land available through the land grant to make the transcontinental work with the every other parcel was given to the railroads the country recognizing that that increases the tax base of the for revenue for the for the country and but the sale of it incentivizes the railroads to um sell it off as quick as possible give her that tax burden but it also made land very cheap to people and in between 1860 and 1910 the the number of, of farms tripled from two million to six million, and then and then um, people living on farms in 1860 was about 10 million, and then in 1880 22 million, and then 31 million in 1905, and um, the railroads made land cheap, low interest, so that people would get on the farms, and then the railroads became more valuable by shipping freight to the farms and, and, and shipping products from the farms to market. Let's go to the next slide. And finally, we're just gonna talk just a little bit about social roles that, and I, and I know yeah, it, it, I, I've glossed over the amount of freight that railroads move because uh, um, I just wanted mostly the impact on the, the, the average human being that the transcontinental made but freight is why railroads were were um, built moving freight allowed railroads to become solvent and get wealthy and and um that's why they were built um so and and the romantic part of passenger travel in some ways it almost i mean it it becomes necessity and everything like that but the money was made on the on the freight but um, going back to uh, social roles, um, railroads helped break some of the the issues that um, that society had become stratified in, and and in a couple of these areas, class, gender, and and then to some extent race. Um, in in prior to the railroad, if if you wanted to travel across the country, 
you know, you could do it poor by, you know, by foot, or you could, you know, ride a stagecoach, which meant you typically rode for a hard day, got into a safe hotel, and were treated as 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 well as your money could get you treated, and and you would uh, get cleaned up, get fed good food, sleep in a safe room, or depend on what your class did, you know, if, if you you know, you found a place to sleep on the side of the road or, 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 you know, in tent and, and wherever you could find place to sleep, but the rich always could make it across safely. And, and, um, and then when you woke in the morning, you'd had taken care of your personal business and, and were able to get back into traveling mode. Um, when the railroads came in, you had, you had, some beautiful traveling ways if you owned your own coach and you had your own kitchen with your own help and you had your own bedroom, you had your own sitting area. And then you had, that would have been the best way to travel. And then you have first class travel, which is a little bit less than that. You're with other people doing this and then second, third, and then, and then, and then where the really poor and the um, blacks and other and Indians and, and other Native Americans and other people would would ride, and that usually was in you know the worst cars. Sometimes they called them immigrant cars, and it wouldn't cost much. But your accommodations were pretty pretty um, rough and and um, not not comfortable at all, and and typically um, typically not looked after. And so, and in the different class of railroads or the different class of, of traveling, you would get taken care of much better in, in, in some of the first and second class. When the railroads came in, we were in the Victorian era. And so they, they, they copied that in, in the opulence in some of the coaches. And then it became clear to railroad owners that, well, in their minds that their they wanted to keep women separate because um, there is no way a lady would ever want to see what's going on in a car where men were smoking and telling bad jokes and maybe drunk and, and um, un, you know, unkempt. And, and, and then, um, so you get the separation with women and children and then, if their husbands, they would travel with the women and children and then occasionally go back to the smoking car to um, probably to get a break. And then um, sometimes black women were allowed to travel in the women's coach, but sometimes not. Um, but what traveling for 24 hours a day in close company did the different classes in spite of, of race is is your private behavior often now was on public display so if you're waiting for some time to use a bathroom you're going in behind a stranger and that's not so comfortable if you're trying to wake up in the morning and get your hair ready chances are that was in front of or near strangers as well and so your 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 private behavior which was once protected from everybody in, in, in you look at um, old homes that were built in the Victorian era and you know, there was a front room and that's where you entertain guests in the sleeping areas in the back rooms. That's not really where the guests come from because nobody is completely ready to be seen by the public in those areas. And so there's, there's your private behaviors and then your public behaviors and the railroads smash through those because you can't have many private behaviors after traveling for 48 hours. You're just sooner or later going to be laying back with your head back, eyes closed and snoring in front of complete strangers, which is kind of horrifying back then. Maybe not so much now. But one of the, I, I, in this next slide, and this will be my final slide as far as this goes, um, is where the National Car Builder takes this quote, and I just love it. Um, the, this woman, her, the worst part about trains is, 
is it forces young girls to become familiarized with that unattractive object, a sleepy, unwashed man. And I just love that. You know, poor girl should wait until she's married before she ever has to witness that. Um, so a couple of things that we did, and I'm, this, that's our last slide, and we can close that, that down. But we, we at the museum deliberate mightily over the restoration of, of equipment. And um, at the museum, we have the, the only surviving piece of rolling stock that was at the um, completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, and that's Coach 17. Leland Stanford took it out to, um, to Promontory Point. He carried the gold spike from California, and he, he, um, he picked up a silver spike in Reno, and he took it out all the way to, to Promontory Point, and then, and then it was a private car. It had his, uh, had his kitchen and had a sleeping area. And then after that car was done being used by the Central Pacific, it was sold to the Virginia Truckee, and then it made its way into the museum. And with the sesquicentennial of the completion of the Transcontinental, we took a very close look at that because we thought that it was a good candidate to be restored. But we, um, we are very careful about things like that, and we do a feasibility study that discusses the condition of the car, discusses all the information that's available for it, discusses um, the transitions that it's gone through in its life, and, and then looks at the colors it was made, looks at all the information we have for picking a date that, that it could be restored to. And then once you restore that, you automatically exclude every other date. And so if we did it on May 10th, 1869, then May 8th and all previous dates were gone. And every date, every bit of history that that car went through is gone later. And so because 90% of the wood gets thrown away, we are diligent in replacing it and um, we, but you can't replace like for like. You can't tell me what year the tree was cut down that built the car. And I, there's no way I can go to get a tree of that date. I can get the same species, but it's probably going to be new growth and it's not going to be, you know, there's a million reasons that you can't duplicate that. But one of the biggest driving decision factors for us was once you eliminate the historic fabric, you no longer can go back for it because we don't keep it. I mean, you don't keep bits of this and bits of that. Unless they're significant, you keep samples of it, but you, you, can't, you, you can't keep it all. And by that, you eliminate the ability to, to look at it again in context. And so we declined to restore that coach. We, we kept it in a state of rest and decay. It's in pretty tough shape. And we did the best we can because it has such national historic significance that we thought we don't need to touch it. We didn't need another coach. And, and, and so our collection plan didn't drive it. So, and you hope you make the right decision. And um, this summer is, is also a, a significant history. It's the, the um, centenary, it's the 100th anniversary of the women's suffrage movement. And um, Nevada was one of the signatories to the, um, to the amendment of the Constitution that allowed women the right to vote. And as part of that, they had a suffrage train that went from Reno to Carson City and the suffragettes went there to see the governor at that time sign sign the bill that that allowed Nevada the women that Nevada allowed the women to write to vote. And when they got on their train, they painted a huge banner and it called it suffragette special, and they nailed it down the side of the car. And um, and then they blew down into Carson City, pulled into the station, and the station agent, of course, saw it, and the, the owners of the railroad got upset about it, and they 
women go off to the Capitol to do the signing, they come back and their sign's not on it and and they want to know who stole their sign. And then there's arguments between the railroad and the and and the suffragettes about what was going on the railroad was indignant just because you had a suffragette special doesn't mean you get to pound nails in it anymore and i get to pound nails in your house and 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 the sign never showed up again and the women went back mad but with the right to vote and then um we're working with the nevada women's history project because they kind of like the idea of doing a suffragette special and and we dug more into it and and it turns out we don't have one car that was in there we have the locomotive in the collection that took that the suffragettes down we have and we have two coaches that went down and then when we look at the newspaper accounts of what took place we went back to coach 17 and looked close at it and uh the suffragette the the women's history nevada women's history project were saying there's no photos of the events there's no physical evidence the banner's gone everything's gone from it all we have is a newspaper account and some letters and we went out and we looked close at coach 17 that we did not restore and found a row of nail holes that we couldn't tie to anything else and we think we've established the car that the suffragettes nailed holes in. And so we're gonna make that part of our celebration this year. And it's, and, it's, and it's part of that where that probably would have summarily made it into the dumpster and we would not have been able to do anything. And it's just one of those kind of cool things that we knew there were some ghosts that were still in there that we hadn't exercised, but we didn't think we'd learn about it within a year of making that decision. So that's kind of cool. Now, John, we've got a video um, when this car was in California, it was um, it was in Hollywood and in some films. Um, Clint Eastwood was did Pale Rider, and that was part of it. And there's a bunch of other movies. But while it was there, the the um, a species of woodpecker put some holes in it, and then they would put some acorns in it. And um, these acorns would be in these holes you see the holes there and they would come back later and eat the worms that were in, in the acorns but when they were putting the acorns in those acorns would slip behind and we had no idea how bad it gotten so if you can press play see if that'll play That's Chris DeWitt. He's the the um, the master mechanic of our railroad, the um, chief mechanical officer, and um, a tremendous a tremendous wealth of knowledge. But we had no idea what we were getting into when we started loosening up these panels to do a little bit of, of investigation in the back. But what we found was very fitting for Nevada. Because <laughs> it was a jackpot. Got about three five gallon pails of acorns out of that car and um and the uh, woodpeckers had turned our car into a greener <laughs> that's good you can stop it there there's no more to be seen so with that um i can entertain some questions um hopefully not all of you are asleep And if you do have a question, uh, please raise your hand um, by clicking on uh, participants and then raise hand. Or if you have video on, feel free to wave at me.
Well, I think that uh, we we've answered all the questions. Apparently, <laughs> I I do have a question, Dan. Um, what are the normal days and hours of the railroad museum? <laughs> We're, we're open Wednesdays to Mondays when we're allowed to open. At this time, we, like everybody else, are closed. And um, we are working through plans on opening back up. Um, we have nothing in concrete. My goal is to be opening up by Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a good weekend for us to be open, and it's a good start. And then um, we have to implement social distancing because our train rides are run by our volunteers. We're always so careful because that is the, the risky community. Those are the people that we want to want to say we have, we have people that have been volunteering for 40 years and they're in their eighties and we just couldn't afford to lose them. And um, so we want to be very careful with that. But um it, it's by no means established. We were an agency of the state government and the governor determines when we're going to open and based on his guidance, we'll, we'll implement um, safety measures to open back up. But man, if we could open up by Memorial Day, that would be a great thing. And Dan, do you have any, uh, or Lorraine has a question coming in here in the chat box, just one okay, moment. I didn't understand where you said to raise your hand. I didn't see an icon for that. So I just went into chat. But the question is, is there a date for that they're looking for for the um, women's uh, train to run or to do some other event for the suffragette? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, good grief. It's in August um, that that we're going to celebrate that. And it's the first part of August. I don't have the date right off the top of my head. Shame on me. But um, we are going to connect the two trains that we know, the two pieces of equipment we know that was there. Coach 17 is in no condition to move at all. But we are going to... Um, we're going to put coach four into the train mix and, and it'll be a premium price. We've never let the public onto that, but for this event, we, I've, man, the women's history project is such an amazing, um, uh, 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 such an amazing mission that we want to support it so much. I, I did, I did some work with the women's history project with um, soldiers coming back from Afghanistan and the stories that they were able to tell were stories that I'd never experienced and, and were so thoughtful that I just became an instant fan of, of their work. And so we want to support them. This will be a fundraiser for them. And um, so it's August. It'll be on our, it's on our Facebook page um, and it's on the Nevada women's history project. At this time, we plan on having safety in place to go forward if we have, um, thank you, Cheryl. She is so good, isn't she? Um, we, we plan on going forward with this, taking all the safety precautions we have to to do it. But I don't, I mean, you just don't get a, a, a 100th anniversary. You don't get a centennial celebration. And this is an important one. Dan, we have another question from the chat uh, from Carla. Uh, were people in the immigrant car able to use the bathroom facilities? It, I mean, I mean bathrooms are, if there was one in a car, you could. If you were happened to be in a box car that was converted to an immigrant car, it was probably pretty rough, um, like a bucket. Can't hear you, John. I'm sorry. Uh, Lorraine has another question. Please go ahead, Lorraine. I stepped away, so I'm going to re-listen to this dialogue, but 
Native Americans, were they allowed to ride the trains? Did I miss that part? Yes, and in some ways they had some priority. Um, I, 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 I can give you this, this story about the Carson in Colorado because it traveled through um, some very inhospitable territory. The, uh, and the railroad wanted to be able to run a railroad through lands that were, may have been disputed. The railroad would stop if somebody waved if an American wave, they would stop and pick them up and take them where they wanted to go. And, and I'm not sure that they even charge for that. Thank you. I do want to, I do want to talk about a book. If you want to learn more about um, the transcontinental, we, is that in reverse? Oh, this is terrible. Okay, good. It looks good. All right. This is Waiting for the Cars. Um, our his curator of history, Wendell Huffman, and Howard Goldblum, Goldbaum wrote this book. And um, they put together um, so many great photos from Al Hart. And in the book, the construction of the railroad, if you look at that photo, it's stereo images. And um, Al Hart did uh, so many photos across the transcontinental during the construction. And what we ended up doing was we made a, took those stereo photos and we put them in 3D. And so now you can look at them with the narration that was carefully created. And you look at the photos and, it, and it's such a great book. And we have this in the museum, it's our own publication. And it's well worth your bookshelf, especially if you're looking for something good to read during your um, stay at home time. It's, it's a great story and it's a great story well done. So give us a call, 687-6953, 687-6953, and uh, we can get you a copy. Oh, that's great. Folks can order it over the phone and you will send yep. it out. We'll, we'll make it happen. That's great. Neat. Well, no other questions at the moment. Um, feel free to sneak your last one in there, but I want to thank you, Dan, so much for taking this online. Thank you for sharing this information. That's a great story. And I cannot wait to come visit the Nevada State Railroad Museum when we're back in business. So thank you for your time. Thanks for being here. Uh, terrific working with you. Thank you for making it easy. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Cheryl. And folks, don't forget the next uh, historic Reno Preservation Society program coming up on May 20th. Uh, and check out our website for more programs, information, get a library card, and everybody have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you all.